Hello and welcome back to the Villa Filler podcast, Aston Villa 1, Everton 2. What on earth went on there? I'm almost lost for words in a way. Obviously, I wasn't at the game, hence why you're seeing this so fast. There's no way the club were getting 35 quid from me to sit in a, in my seat when this has been free in previous years. So having to watch on a stream, obviously not ideal. But in a way, I'm kind of glad I didn't make the jaunt down from the north to Villa Park because that was almost spineless until the sort of end of the game, that final sort of 10 minutes. Villa just, I don't know, we seem really soft. We seem like we've got a really soft underbelly. And this is something that needs addressing. And I think we've we've maybe overestimated just how good the squad actually is. Let's go to the lineup because you got you know, you guys will have seen in the preview, those of you that watched it, not many people actually did. But, you know, I was a big advocate for a sort of similar team that we fielded against Leisure Warsaw, again, you know, with all these games coming up, the squad is something that is so important that we rotate and keep people fresh. And especially with the injuries we're managing, obviously Diego Carlos was on the bench tonight, which is good in terms of him coming back. But again, you don't really want to rush him. But I mean, I'm looking at the I'm looking at the lineup right here. John McGinn at left back. Who'd have thought that would have been a thing? Obviously, Leander Dendonka gets his first start in what feels like an absolute eternity. And doesn't necessarily cover himself in glory. And I just think in general, like again, this team should have got things done. But if we're being completely honest, the lineup that Sean Dyche rocked up with tonight is was pretty strong from an Everton point of view. He tried to keep things tight with a back three come five. But the team that he fielded was was very good. It's a it's a very good team. There's no two ways about it. But I'm like, I'm just surprised. Like, I'm, it's almost sort of caught me off guard, this, because, again, you know, like, it doesn't help Leon sort of came off early on injured. And look, I'm not saying if Leon was fit, this would have been a different game. Do not get my words twisted. That sort of throws a spanner in the works early on. Obviously, Nicolo sort of comes on and replaces him. But I just, I don't know. I'm still trying to process this, actually, guys. I'm still trying to process it. Obviously, James Garner scores early on and there's a bit of sort of fannying around at the back. And then he sort of, you know, the, the ball's played into him. It's, it's a great strike, to be fair. I think even Emmy would have struggled to have got a hand to it. Um, obviously, preventable more so in the build-up rather than the actual finish. But it's never ideal to go a goal down within the first 15 minutes. So, you know, scoring in front of the Everton fans as well. We obviously had the North stand. It's just, yeah, it's, it's I, I don't know. Obviously, it's, it's never great to start going 1-0 down. Um, I just think, let's talk about the midfield, right? Because the midfield is so important to how Unai Emery plays and sets up. And Bubakar Kamara and Douglas Louise are phenomenal. That midfield pairing is as good as it gets outside of the top six. Even rivals some top six clubs, maybe you could argue, on their day. And it's going to be, you know, big shoes to fill for anybody who steps up in these games, right? And I do, you know, to a certain degree, feel sorry for Leander Dendonka because he quite clearly isn't at the, the caliber of footballer that Louise and Kamara are. You know, they Dendonka is a system player and we're not playing the system that uses him to the best of his abilities. So when he steps in for someone like Bubakar Kamara, who obviously is just such a natural, there is going to be a gulf in class. There's no two ways about it. But I just feel like with, with you can't really have Tillemans and Kamara in the same midfield. I sort of joked about it in the stands at Villa Park a few weeks ago, thinking, Jesus Christ, imagine having them two in a, in a pivot. That would be absolutely disastrous. And whilst we didn't see them in a pivot tonight, Nevertheless, it was disastrous. Obviously, Tillman's kind of playing on the left side of that midfield, I guess, sort of giving John McGinn that sort of cover at left back. Again, very strange, but th there's just not enough legs in that midfield. That's too much work for Douglas Louise to be doing all by himself. And again, you know, I hate to say, sit here on this podcast and tell you that I'm right about something, which is obviously bad for the club because there is no glory in that. 
when I criticised Yuri Tillemans against the Crystal Palace, I got absolute pelters. And okay, he played two passes which contributed to two goals. But his overall play just isn't good enough. He looks lethargic, leggy. These are all things that we knew before he signed as well. And these are signs that we'd seen at Leicester. He doesn't necessarily get about the pitch. He's not the most athletic and or mobile. And it's just a bit like, you can kind of take it for what it is when he's sort of scoring and assisting. And, you know, there's 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 an argument to be made for, well, at least he's contributing. But I mean, and, you know, and you look at it and on the surface, 93% pass accuracy made one key pass in the game, attempted two long balls, had two shots blocked, had a shot off target. It reads like semi decently, but like the eye test doesn't lie. The eye test never lies. And that's the thing, you know. Dan and I, we love to talk about data on this podcast and use data to sort of back our points. But fundamentally, you know, data can be skewed. And the eye test will tell you that Yuri Tillman so far at Aston Villa has not been it. So him sort of, you know, as as I as I mentioned the other week, sort of I'm fine with players being aggrieved that they're not playing. That's, you you know, you're going to want everyone to want to play. That's totally understandable. But to kind of come out to the media and say that and then put in the performances he has tonight and Leslie of Warsaw and at Crystal Palace, it just doesn't really sit right with me. And there's no doubt that Yuri Tillemans has the quality to be a fantastic player. We've seen that through his career. He's just not necessarily shown it so far. And... It's quite worrying, actually, because this felt like a really good depth signing when we made him, right? And, you know, here we are. We're now out of the, the Carabao Cup, so this is one less competition to worry about. You know, had we have won, we're like, what, three or four games away from Wembley, that kind of thing. They all obviously add up if you're going to try and go far in all of these competitions. But it's quite worrying that, you know, tonight at a home tie against Everton, who, again, you know, obviously off the back of a very big win against Brentford, as we mentioned in the preview. But aside, realistically, we should be dispatching of at home in the earlier rounds of the Carabao Cup. It's quite worrying that we can't sort of look to these fringe players and lean on them and and trust them to get a job done. It's quite, as I say, I, I, I keep repeating myself, but it's very worrying. Um because, you know, we can't just rely on the same eleven, And it just, you know, it makes me wonder, obviously, we've got Brighton at home on Saturday. Uh, I believe Brighton played Chelsea tonight, I want to say. Uh, Chelsea obviously won that game. Brighton coming off a bit of a, well, this is, I, I guess it's a two-game uh, loss run, if we're counting the European game as well. Uh, in fact, no, because Brighton won at the weekend, didn't they? But, you know, the, the form has been hit and miss is the point that I'm trying to make recently. They've had some ups, they've had some downs. It's going to be an incredibly hard game. And then when you look at our schedule, I mean, after that, what is it? Is it Zrinski at home in the Europa League? And it's again, like, how are we how are we rotating these players? John McGinn is somebody who I feel could play 90 minutes four times a week because he's just, he's just got that engine, hasn't he? But, like, we can't be putting these players through that. Konza and Kashi clearly needed a break. They've been playing so much football recently could put McGinn into that as well obviously Diaby's had a few sort of appearances off the bench you know when you're looking at the Warsaw game in particular resting Ollie Watkins makes sense given John Duran his his run out here when he scored the goals when he's been given the opportunity in the Premier League in the Europa League so this is a game that John Duran absolutely should have started but you know it, it comes to a point where we have to then bring on Ollie Watkins we're bringing on uh, I mean Zaniolo came on as well didn't he um, but I don't know. It's just I'm I'm almost lost for words, really, because I I expected us to take the Carabao Cup seriously. That's the one cup that you know not as many teams take as seriously. So it kind of felt like an easy sort of potential route to silverware, which is obviously you know you go and hire Unai Emery, specialist in winning cups, and then get knocked out at Everton at the first chance it's like I don't know I don't know I don't mean for this to come across as a rant it's definitely not the end of the world don't get me twisted guys but it just it it's frustrating and I think again you know I keep repeating the same point but Unai Emery will learn a lot about these players in these type of games you definitely learn more from a loss than you do in a win especially about character and 
you know, so far from what we've seen from Yuri Tillemans, I find it really hard to believe that he's going to be somebody who is frequently starting for Villa and, and, and being involved in big matches and big moments like he, you know, sort of cried to the press about wanting to do. Um, so, yeah, I, th- I feel like we have to sort of... May- uh, maybe there's, like, squad issues in January that we have to address. We have to look to strengthen a bit better. Um, you know, I mean, Tillemans gives the ball away for that Dom- Dominic Calvert-Lewin goal, doesn't he? It's a, it's a really sloppy pass. And Esri doesn't really know what to do with it. He steamrolls through, and it's a great finish from Calvert Lewin, who's you know clearly full of confidence after his goal against Brentford, back to full fitness or sort of getting there. So that's a big goal for him. But um, yeah, it's frustrating. And, and you know, it's like you know tonight's the night. Bubakar Kamara he gets his first goal for the club. Like he takes it quite well. To be fair, it does sort of bobble in. But Pickford isn't really a mug. So you know, obviously you know, you're happy for Kamara, but it kind of felt like we didn't really wake up to this game until it was too late. And it it just didn't, there wasn't that urgency of it being a cup tie. And I don't know. I mean, I feel like some players will feel a bit hard done by that they maybe weren't involved. But I think it's probably, you know, for the best. Obviously, it's good to see Amari Kellerman come on as well, get involved. He's someone that I think, you know, again, he's not someone who's going to be playing regularly or whatever. And, you know, at the time he came on, you know, the game was almost dead and gone. So it, it sort of made sense that he would get some minutes just for the experience, you know, had the final what, 10 or 12 minutes, didn't he? Um, so obviously that's great for Amari, you know, obviously hopefully next time when he plays, it's it's due to better circumstances. But I guess all eyes go to Brighton really. And uh, I'll be back to preview that tomorrow, I believe. Um, but yeah, that was just a little bit of a rant we're out of the League Cup and hopefully we can make things right in the league and it just kind of feels like and maybe this is true maybe this is true and there are you know sort of, there is sort of merit to it but it feels like the league is quite clearly the priority you know we got things done really early doors against Hibs which is obviously great for the tie but then the second leg wasn't as great losing to Warsaw losing this it makes you wonder with the financial incentive that the Premier League offers, you know, depending on high, how, how high you finish in the table, it makes you wonder what Villa's priority truly is. And it'll be interesting to see, you know, should we even make it out of our Conference League group? How far we go? Um, food for thought. Guys, let me know your thoughts on this game in the comment section down below. Dan Wise, we will be back soon. I know there's a few comments you guys missed. Dan, I miss Dan too. He is on holiday and I hope him and Chloe are having an absolutely amazing time. I know they will be because I know they won't have watched that game. So I know that whatever's happening, Dan is having a good evening and that is all that counts. So yeah, guys, if you enjoyed, make sure you hit a like, comment your thoughts below and subscribe for more. Up the Villa.